uh, it sounds like I'm exaggerating, but it's ruined my life. Three times a week, generally, I would go out on my bike. I can't do that now. I'm really, I don't know whether it's me being over nervous or the fact that the head injury, you don't know what would happen if you did fall off again. Cycle helmets. There's an endless debate as to whether cyclists should be made to wear them or not. I grew up cycling with my family and my granddad was a big influence on this. He cycled for nearly 70 years until October 2018 when he was knocked off his bike and sustained a head injury. Without wearing his helmet, it's likely he wouldn't be here today. This has made me curious as to whether people think cyclists should be made to wear helmets by law. After just over three months in hospital, my granddad has been allowed home, but he doesn't remember anything about the day of his accident or much of his treatment. I don't remember at all ever being in any pain in the hospital, at all. But I must have been, obviously. After I'd been in there a month or two, show me a scan and really I think the treatment as far as I'm aware but I could be completely wrong is not waving your head about too much you know so that it, it, it you get a bleed on the brain and if it's very serious you you're obviously not going to make it but mine were relatively it was a relatively small one I wanted to find out more about head injury treatment and the impact it has on other people. So I spoke to a former neurology nurse who is now a senior lecturer in health and social care at the University of Lincoln. I think there's lots of things that can impact um, on somebody who's had a head injury from minor stuff like uh, constant headaches, migraines, I say minor, but constant headaches, constant migraines, uh, right through to things like PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder based on why the injury happened in the first place and subsequent mental health issues that may be related to that. Depending on the severity of the head injury, we'd undertake what we call an A to E assessment, a systematic assessment that starts in looking, make sure the airway is patent, breathing, circulation, because actually, surprisingly, um, things that kill patients are airway problems and breathing problems, not necessarily the head injury. So the head injury sort of takes less of a priority if you like. But the treatment will still get to the head injury and the way we manage the head injury is we will um, uh, assess them using a number of scales that we use in healthcare. The more comprehensive way is what we call the Glasgow Coma Score, also called the GCS. And that assesses levels of consciousness, uh, whether the patient can verbalise to you, whether they can talk to you, and also assesses their motor response, what they're doing with their limbs. And that will tell us whether there's any injury to the brain stem which has caused some of these problems. So there is a systematic way that we, we assess all patients. Bikes have existed since 1860, but this first type of bike, known as a velocipede, wasn't particularly popular. Ten years later, with the introduction of the high-wheeled bicycle, also known as the penny farthing, cycling began to take off, though it was common for these to hit rocks and cracks in the road, meaning cyclists would fall off and hit their heads. By the end of the 1800s, cycling clubs and racing had grown in popularity. Members began to become concerned for their safety and started advocating the use of a helmet. Pith helmets were introduced and although they weren't the strongest material, they did save people and were popular amongst racing cyclists. By the early 20th century, racers felt that they needed more protection and so began to wear helmets made from leather and wool. In 1970, testing was done on helmets used at the time and showed that they weren't effective in a crash. It wasn't until 1975 Bell Auto Parts created the first proper helmet for cyclists. Since then, helmets have developed and changed to what we see today. Since my granddad's accident, I have been interested in finding out people's opinions on helmet laws. In the UK, there is currently no law enforcing cyclists to wear helmets. Some feel it's a good idea and others think it's not. Sostrans are a charity that aim to make it easier for people to walk and cycle and they are responsible for over 14,000 miles of quiet walking and cycling paths across the country. They feel there shouldn't be a law enforcing cyclists to wear helmets. 
I went to visit them at their office in Nottingham to find out why this is. Sustrans recommends the use of cycle helmets. Cycle helmets in many situations can be hugely beneficial if they are used correctly, and by that I mean they're the right size and they are fitted correctly. Um, however, what we do not support is we don't support the compulsory use of cycle helmets for the very simple reason that um, where cycle helmets have been introduced and made compulsory, the number of cyclists has dropped off dramatically. One of the concerns is um, how you would enforce any compulsory wearing. And one of the things we don't want to do would be to criminalise a whole generation of potentially young people. And if you say, well, it would be the adult, well, OK, effectively, you would stop cycling to school because when the child leaves school, and they cycle off to go home, would the teachers have to ensure that they all wore cycle helmets? Well, the teachers have got better things to do and effectively would ban cycling to school. And the benefits of people walking and cycling are huge. They far outweigh the risks that are associated with it. So whilst we wholeheartedly recommend the correct use of a well-fitted cycle helmet, which will offer you protection in certain situations, we don't support the compulsory use of cycle helmets. Australia is one of the only countries in the world where it is compulsory for cyclists to wear helmets by law. The use of cycle helmets has been enforced since the early 1990s, and in the years after they were introduced, cycling began to drop dramatically. Before the law was introduced in 1990, a survey in Melbourne counted 3,121 cyclists. A year after the law was introduced, the same survey was conducted and counted only 2,011 cyclists, showing that enforcing helmet laws can discourage people from getting on a bike. I was curious as to what the former neurology nurse thought about Sostrin's view on the debate. I do think there should be a law enforced for cycle helmets. Now, we may not do that for everybody, but if, if anything, if we don't go for enforcing cycle helmets for everybody, I think we should enforce it for children, at least. But hopefully everybody should be. And my reason for that is, is other road users who are on similar type devices, and I'm referring to mopeds or, um, or motorcycles, all of these items are designed to make us move at a quicker pace than we probably would do if we're walking. Uh, but when you add in the dimension of actually you're on the road and you are with other people, um, and we make it mandatory in law that actually motorcyclists and moped users wear a helmet, I, I cannot understand why we don't make that same law for cyclists to do exactly the same thing. Do I think um, less people cycling or wearing helmets is better than more people cycling with no helmets? I'd prefer to see less people cycling with helmets than more people cycling with no helmets. It's clear to me that although helmets can save lives, the enforcement of a law is not practical and would be difficult for enforcers to keep on top of. But what does the future hold for my granddad? Well, it's unlikely he'll go out on his bike again, but instead cycle at home on a turbo trainer, as the risks of falling off and causing more damage to his head is too great. But I wondered what he would miss most about going out on his bike. Three times a week, generally, I would go out on my bike for at least a couple of hours, and I'd go out with one of my friends, and we would go and you know sit down in a cafe for a little while, and then ride home again. If you go out on a, on a bike on a ride, and you enjoy it, and you like, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's hilly or don't it, but you can lose things that have been worrying you for a long say you're doing something like promoting a race and you still can't get enough help or something like that that plays on your mind whereas if you go out for a ride and i, I don't go out for a ride every time i'm worried about something because <laughs> i don't worry about much but um you know it does make a difference 
to settling you down, you know, particularly when I was at work. It's different from going out on your bike and racing, which was a different sort of quite a nice thing because you, you're in with a group of people who are all doing what you want to do and I was never very good so I didn't have any pressure on me at all really. I just used to go out and like racing and when everybody beat me it didn't really worry me because I knew they would. Um, but you know that it's it's not calming, it really is, I suppose, you know, it's, uh, but it's, it's so, it's a, just a nice feeling. If I could bottle it, I'd make a fortune.